<laughs> do they act like humans when they're stoned? No, they're, they get munchies so bad. Do they really? No, they don't. <laughs> they, don't. they actually start peeing all over the place, and I'm glad humans don't do that. Peeing. All righty, well, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know what you do for a living. Yeah, so my name is Melanie Summers, and I'm a full-time veterinarian. Full-time veterinarian. Yep. And your favorite drink is sweet tea? <laughs> sweet so. tea. So Sweet tea. Well, cheers to you. Cheers. I've never really drank much sweet tea. Are you from the south? <laughs> I mean, Wichita, Kansas. It's about <laughs> as south as you can get, right? Yep. I guess so. Yeah. For the Midwest. Yep. Yep. So you're a veterinarian. How did you get into that? So growing up, I was always had you know, animals at our house and things like that. And there was one point where I came home from work one day and this uh, young girl came up to me and she had this cat that got hit by a car. And she's like, hey, can you help me? Do you know where I should take this animal? And I felt super helpless. So I was like, I have no idea. This cat's probably gonna die. Um, so after that, I, you know, kind of looked at it as, you know what, these people have really strong bonds to their animals. And I think that's awesome. And I, I thought that would be a good career path in general, just because I really love being around animals, but like seeing what they do to people is the right. coolest thing for sure. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah. That's a cool aspect of it. Um, how old were you when that happened? Probably in high school. High school? Yeah. So that started the whole snowball effect to you going down this path? It did. My dad also wanted to be a veterinarian, but he always said that he couldn't stay in the blood. So maybe it was the a little blood. bit of a challenge, too, to see if I could do something that my dad really wanted to do that he never could do. So Yeah, yeah, because you're sort of grouped in with the medical personnel that deal with blood and other things. Yep. Uh, all yep. the stuff that comes with that. Yep, all the good and bad. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. So you ended up going to vet school? Yeah, so I went to K-State. Um, and it was four years of veterinary school, but then I went to, before that, four years at Newman. So a lot of school, but I was crying across the stage when I graduated because I was so glad to be done with school. Oh, so yeah. ready to start doing what I wanted to. So That's the worst part of any job, really, is yes. doing all the schooling for it, usually. So it's four years and then another four? Four years of undergrad, so just at a, a regular college, and then four years that's just strictly veterinary school. So it's almost like going to med school. It is. We can also do internships, things like that, if we want to specialize afterwards, too. But it is definitely a lot of school. So can you get your degree in anything during your undergrad? You can. I was a biology degree. Biology degree. Yep. I figured if I don't make it into vet school, maybe I'll figure something out with a biology degree. So. Yeah, yeah. There yep. you go. So eight years total. Eight years total. Wow. Yep. That's a lot of schooling. It That's is. basically like a doctor, right? It is. Are it you is. a doctor then? I am a doctor. You're so a doctor. At at work, I go by Dr. Summers. Dr. <laughs> so. Summers. So is there an official title for a veterinarian, or is that just uh, a DV, blanket? DVM. DVM? Um, is what we go by, Dr. of Veterinary Medicine. Okay. So, yep. That's awesome. Yeah. So how hard is the actual, what is that called after the undergrad? Is that med school, or is that vet school? Vet school. Vet school? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was pretty difficult, I would say, and it's pretty hard to get into. Um, the only reason I went to Newman course it's a good school but they had a 99 percent acceptance rate into vet school so I was like oh man even if I'm not super smart I can get in hopefully yeah. so um, not very many people do make it into vet school people try several several years in a row I was able to get in and the schooling was hard that's all you do you can't get a job you don't have time for anything I had some kids while I was in school and that kind of was a distraction for me as far as get my mind off of studying too much because otherwise I would have just kept my head in the books so yeah yeah wow so pretty hard. Do you have to do like rotations and everything like that? Our last year we did rotations. So we went to different areas of the hospital and did rotations at that point. Okay. Well, that is basically just like med school. It is. It is. That's crazy. Just so. learn more species. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah. I was, I was wondering, does anything translate over? Like if there was an emergency situation, would you ever be like... Would you be of any assistance at all to somebody that like a human? I tell people I do not work on people. So <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot that translates, but I also know my boundaries. I learned what I learned and I, I don't want to work on people. And that's why I went to work on animals. So, yep. That's awesome. Yeah. I guess it takes a certain kind of person, right? Yep. So was uh, vet school everything that you thought it would be learning wise? Do you learn about every animal? Do you learn about the yeah. majority of 
what a certain pet is or what? So we learned about everything. So dogs and cats were the main focus, but we also lear- learned on um, large animals. So horses, cattle, goats, um, exotics as well. So I did a lot in the zoo that was up there as well. So you kind of got a good general knowledge on everything, which was pretty cool. So, so mainly the focus is on mammals though? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Do you do anything when it comes to like reptiles or, or other things like amphibians? I do. So we work on a, what's called exotics, which is all the, you know, the different animals that you don't typically see as pets. So I just had a blue iguana in last week. I um, work on tortoises, lizards, snakes. I've had a, you know, a 10 foot boa in our hospital at one point. So keeps it interesting. So that way, you know, if you're just used to working on dogs and cats, it's kind of nice to refresh it a little bit and do something different. So what's the biggest difference between working on a reptile versus a mammal? So as, (laughs) as we learned back way back in school, you know, reptiles can't, you know, keep their body temperature the way they're supposed to they're cold blooded and so the habitat is the biggest thing people get reptiles and they don't realize how much work they are because they have to be kept at certain temperatures certain humidity so they're a lot harder so it's just usually the habitat is not correct or the diet's not correct when it comes to those types of animals okay so people get in over their heads a lot with reptiles i'd just say they probably don't look into it as much as they should yeah. Or they get gifted a pet. That's yep. always the worst, isn't it? Yep, that's for sure. Gift somebody a pet and they're not ready for it at all. <laughs> they're like, shit. Well, and they don't realize how much they cost. You know, people come in and they're like, this was a free pet. Now it's $600 for me to bring it in. So <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's the big thing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, that's interesting. So uh, you went to vet school. You graduated. Did you know that you wanted to start your own business from the start? I honestly never wanted to start my own business. Really? So, yeah. I've got four kids, and I knew I wanted to make sure I paid attention to them and didn't focus on a business. I put everything I have into what I do. So with school, and then I knew if I was going to be a business owner, I was like, there's no way my family is going to see me ever. So I started off and actually did mixed animal practice where I worked on cattle and horses and dogs and cats, everything. And then realized pretty quickly after a couple of years that I didn't like getting dragged out of supper and yeah. middle of the night or on winter storms, having to go you know, pull a calf or do a C-section. So after two years of doing it, which I loved it, but it just wasn't the best thing for my family, we moved back to, um, to Wichita and that's where I started doing small animals again. And then I realized that I really wanted to practice really good and again I like to put everything I have into what I do so everywhere I worked I just wasn't quite happy with how we were practicing I was like we want to do the best let's do the best and my husband was like just open your own place and I was like no I don't want to do that because I just I know what it's gonna end up being like and I just I won't be able to let it go as far as putting all my effort into it but eventually it came to that and I opened my own place and here I am and it's going good. So <laughs> Yeah. A lot that goes with owning your own business. Yeah. A lot of work people don't realize. Yeah, and trying to balance everything is the hardest thing. It's just balancing family life and work life. So. What would you say the biggest difference is between owning your own business and not owning your own business in the vet world is? So constantly making sure that everything is being ran exactly how you want it to be perceived. So I opened my practice for a certain reason and if I've hired somebody and they're not doing what I would like them to do, then they represent me. And so this is different now because I used to be able to go to work, come home, not think about it. And now every single second it's open or not open, I'm constantly thinking about it and wanting to make sure it's continuing to be the practice I wanted to open. So it, it's definitely a lot more wow. yeah. outside of work. Were you anticipating that at all? That whole side of it? That's why I didn't want to. That's <laughs> why you didn't order. want to do this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Any employee you have is representing you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That and the, the business aspect of it. So we don't learn much business in veterinary school. And I didn't take any business classes. And here I am having to call the IRS, figure out what taxes I'm supposed to be doing. And so there's a lot more to oh, yeah. owning a business that you don't realize till you get in there. And then you get these letters saying, hey, you're supposed to pay these on the taxes. And you're like, oh, gosh, I guess I didn't <laughs> look into that. <laughs> yep. So, Learn as you go, I guess. Yep. That's a... Uh, the biggest thing, I guess, people that jump in, you got to kind of jump in to learn it, yep. you know? Big undertaking. So what kind of opportunities are there if you don't own your own business? Yeah, so you can work for somebody that does own their own business as far as, you know, 
just be an associate and go to work and go home and not have to worry about the part of owning a business. There's other tons of other things that you can do as a veterinarian that a lot of people don't think about. So you can go into like dog food nutrition, you can go work at a research lab, you can work for the government. So there's tons of stuff that you just don't think about when you think of a veterinarian. Wow. Yeah. All sorts of opportunities. All I think of when I think of a veterinarian is somebody like you that's uh, giving my dog shots yep. or uh, stitching up a wound. Yep. Yeah. But there's all sorts of stuff out there. All sorts of stuff. So a lot of people go into veterinary medicine thinking, oh, I don't have to deal with people. I can just deal with pets. Well, I deal with people way more than I do with the pets because we have to talk to the people to figure out what's going on. So I always tell people if you you know don't enjoy talking to people, you should not be a veterinarian. You have to be a very big people person because that's a huge part of it. I'm sure you see some see some pretty shitty people too that <laughs> treat their animals like garbage. Well, treat people and animals, you know, and that's in every industry I think is, you know, you're going to have those people that come in that don't appreciate anything you do when you put all your you know, everything you have into what you do to make it good and that you, you're doing a really good job and then you just get treated kind of, you know, poorly. So, right. But I'm sure you see that in every industry. So. Oh, yeah. Any yeah. customer service industry. Yeah. What's one of the craziest uh, pet owner stories you have? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I have lots. So we, we have a lot of people that come in that, you know, think because we work on pets that we really want to work on them as well. So we get lots of stories from owners on things that we don't even want to know, whether it has to do with what happens when they go to the bathroom or they show us something on themselves that, you know, we see in those exam rooms. <laughs> so <laughs> The owners want you to give medical advice yep. for them? Yep. And we get, You're shitting me. Nope. We get shown lots of fun stuff. So I've uh, seen it all. That's bizarre. <laughs> Unfortunately. Do they think that they can get around getting billed for going to their own doctor by talking to you or what? Well, the actual, the cool thing about it is they trust us so much. And I think that's it is that they just really trust our, um, you know, everything we do. And so they're like, hey. I'd rather talk to you about my stuff than go to the doctor. <laughs> so not always what I'd like, but I mean, I guess I'm happy that they trust us that much. Like, hey, my dog's having some major <laughs> bowel issues. I'm kind of having the same thing. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So. Have you ever had an anybody talk about their pet, but they're really talking about themselves? Like, is it weird if my dog stool is soft all the time? Yeah, I would say actually they just, they're just open with us and they tell us. I would, you know, the, the biggest thing owners get really secretive about is honestly when their pets get into their recreational uh, drugs. Oh, really? <laughs> so, yes. So because, you know, it's illegal here, a lot of times we see marijuana, toxicity, things like that, or who knows what else. But the biggest thing is I go in there, I'm like, so is there any chance your kids' friends brought something over? <laughs> um, so we have to do a lot of that when it comes to to those types of things. I never even thought about that aspect of it. Yeah. You see a lot of drugged up pets in? Uh, every now and then. Really? I, I, we had one not too long ago and I walk in and the owner's like, first of all, I want to make sure that we have like a HIPAA. And I'm like, oh gosh, this doesn't sound good. <laughs> so there's you know no, it's going to be bad. When yeah, there's, <laughs> there's no HIPAAs for pets, but I'm like, I, I promise you, I'm not the police. I'm not going to turn you in for anything. So yeah, it gets interesting that way too. So what happens if you get a dog that's stoned? So a lot of times we just have to make sure nothing's been like internally injured from overdosage because usually they're overdosed pretty well. Mm -hmm. And so we have to do blood work, things like that, and then put them on fluids just to flush things out. So, but usually after a while they, they get around and, and start feeling a little bit better. So do they act like humans when they're stoned? No, they're, they get munchy so bad. Do they really? No, they don't. <laughs> they, don't. they actually start peeing all over the place and I'm glad humans don't do that. Peeing so. all over the place? <laughs> they do. They have no control of it, so. You're kidding. Nope. So just be happy that we don't have the same things that dogs do. Wow. <laughs> have you seen any dogs that ate, ate hard drugs? Uh, if we did, owners aren't super honest with us. Usually they tell us it's something not as hard, probably. Just yeah. because, you know, they, they don't want us to know that thing. They don't want to seem super neglectful like that. Yes. Or they're just nervous we're going to turn them in. So. Have you ever seen pets that are real neglected on accident, like the owners don't realize their practices are harming the pet? Um, I would say with obesity is probably the biggest thing. People really? feed their dogs with love, so much love. They just overfeed them and they come in and they're giant. Um, and I try try to be as honest as I can, but it offends people a lot when you say, gosh, your little 
wiener dog looks like a futon. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's probably one of the biggest things. And, and then the opposite side of things, you know, when animals are ready to be put down, I would say a lot of owners are reluctant to do that. And that's where we see them get really, really to the point where they should be put down or they're neglected. And they're just letting their dogs suffer yeah. or their other pets suffer. Yep. Yep. For that's sure. unfortunate. Yes. Yep. The eating thing is it's so easy to do, you know, when you have your dog next to you and you're like, oh. I'm, he wants some steak. Yes. Or I steak know. fat. I tell him you're just killing him with love because that's what they're doing. They don't even realize it. So. What's the worst human food you could give a dog? Sugars and sweets? So grapes, of course, cause kidney failure in dogs. Chocolates. A lot of people know Chocolate, chocolates yeah. do that. Um, chewing gum. We've seen that recently. They have fake sugar and everything. And so if they get a hold of chewing gum, it can kill the dogs. So, yeah. Yeah kind of crazy i had a dog one time where i was cooking some meat and i had it wrapped up in foil yeah. i balled up the foil when i was done and threw it away and he got it yeah. and he ate the foil gosh and yeah. i didn't i was like well hope that comes out oh yeah yeah we see a lot of bones too so a lot of people give their dog bones deer antlers and then i get to give the unfortunate news that we're either going into surgery to remove them or we're taking out some major chewing teeth that cost a lot of money because they've been chewing on bones and antlers so oh, wow. that's another one so antlers aren't good for their teeth antlers are not good so if you can just picture trying to chew on an antler a lot of times we see their big chewing teeth broken which a lot of people don't realize that wow but <laughs> bones are bones are good for your dogs right no they're not no so if you can picture like you drop a you know a plate of glass on the ground and it goes into shards that's what we see happen in the intestines of a dog when they eat a bone a lot of times oh wow just, yeah it beats up the intestinal tract so don't give your dog a bone from a ribeye no please don't unless you want to just support my uh, business and pay for a <laughs> surgery go for it <laughs> so our dog's probably obviously the most common pet you deal with yes definitely yeah definitely. Yep. what would you say a normal day is like for you somebody that owns your own business what's your day like when you walk in the office wow yeah. So saying that I walk in the office and I haven't even taken my coat off and I've got my technician saying, Hey, there's somebody here that needs to see you or, Hey, there's this message from this person. And so I'm like, man, can I just sit down for one second and <laughs> say, Hey, I'm here. You can talk to me now. So right when I get in, it's constant as far as technicians trying to get me to do something or start looking at an animal, things like that. And then it just takes off from there. I'm pretty lucky if we get lunches. I've made it to where we have two-hour lunches, so that way I at least maybe have 30 minutes to an hour to actually have lunch. Oh, really? So we're it's it's pretty crazy. I'd say the veterinary industry is just, I mean, you work all day, and it's hard hours, long hours. I'm there sometimes. I've been there till 3 in the morning um, doing an emergency surgery on a dog, and we stay there until the dog's doing well. And so a lot of people don't realize that. They think, okay, we come in kind of like, you know, other – dentistry or right. even regular doctors human doctors that we you know nine to five or whatever it is and it's not it's we get there we work through our lunches a lot of times we're constantly working over hours just to get things done so well that means your business is booming i guess then, it is right? but we we get burnt out but so <laughs> always swamped yep. everybody has pets yep that's true so you respond to emergency calls too if somebody has a pet issue in the middle of the night not typically i would say so there's an emergency clinic here in town that they we typically refer to but if it's at the end of the day and i love emergencies or if it's during the day and somebody's got an emergency then we see them so every now and then i have some people i know or clients that i know there's things going on with their pets that will come in on the weekend and do things for them too so okay yeah are there any restrictions to the type of pet you'll work on have you ever had something where you're like, I don't know, I can't do anything for you? Like well, uh, the one thing I shouldn't have worked on is when I was in school, you know, I did an exotic rotation where we do all the, you know, different animals, zoo animals. And my professor was like, don't ever work on a monkey. I don't care if you're excited to work on a monkey or not. You don't work on a monkey because, really? they, oh yeah, they carry diseases that we do that can kill us. So, uh. yeah. And you'd picture these cute little monkeys just running around, not thinking that man if you make them mad they will go into you bite you i mean get yeah. crazy <laughs> a lot of people think monkeys are great pets but yeah. they're not the best pets are they no they're not they're not i guess it depends on the type of monkey too because there's all sorts of monkeys but yeah they're probably pretty high maintenance i would imagine they are because you know we don't eat the same foods they do they have to have special diets all those types of things and and they're not with their other monkeys and so they kind of get some social issues behavior issues all the time and 
And then there was the one time I said, yeah, I want to see your monkey. Because I was like, hey, I get to see a monkey? <laughs> Not a good idea. <laughs> Not a good idea? <laughs> no. no. We uh, we put them in isolation knowing all these issues. We gowned up. I mean, you'd think we were like coronavirus, crazy, whatever, um, Ebola, going into a, a room because we're just gowned up completely because we were like, we don't want to get any diseases from this thing. But I was just... You know, I like to see cool stuff. Right. So, and it was a, it was supposed to be like a little pygmy monkey. So it was gonna be little. So I was one like, one of those little guys yeah. that sits on your shoulder. Yeah. I was like, it can't do nothing. So we get in there, um, realizing that that monkey didn't care about anything. It, the owners couldn't even handle it. It got out of the little cage and started jumping all over our shoulders, and we're just sitting there all stiff because I mean that thing could have just bitten our neck, could have bitten oh, our yeah. ears. And that's when the owner was like, hey, uh, just so you know, if it doesn't like you, it'll start chewing on your ears. And I'm like, oh, gosh. Oh, thank you. Whose idea was this? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I've, I've decided I really shouldn't see monkeys anymore unless they come in and they are completely asleep or I give them something to where, you know, it's not a liability issue for me. So Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. How do you even get a monkey? Can you get a monkey legally? Uh, you know, I don't know. Honestly, I I stay out of the legality stuff. We have people that bring in wildlife, that have raccoons, things like that. And there's legalities with all of that stuff. And I'm just here to work on the animals. <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah. you will you work on wild animals too? So we can work on wild animals. Um, of course, I try to refer them out to like, you know, rehab centers, things like that, just because I don't want to get involved if there is something that somebody's not supposed to have. Yeah. So, yeah. That's interesting. I know a lot of people try to raise coyotes or a bobcat in the house and yep. doesn't end up too well. <laughs> Usually doesn't. <laughs> no. Turns out that those thousands of years of evolution that make, gave us dogs today is a necessary step and yes. you can't just take a wild coyote and make it a dog. Yep, you are correct. Have you ever worked on a coyote? I've not worked on a coyote. I've worked on um, baby deer. Baby deer. Raccoons possums things like that so wow that's crazy so no monkeys nobody can bring a monkey into you well i mean i still see this monkey um but ideally i shouldn't see any more <laughs> what about marine life like um fish yeah does a beta count <laughs> <laughs> people bring their betas into you yeah yeah so i've had i've had some fish come in I, in school, I did learn how to draw blood on fish, things like that, which oh, really? is crazy. Yeah. And I always get the question, because I do a lot of career days from kids, like, how do you work on a fish out of water? So you can, and there's veterinarians out there that work at all the aquariums, and you just don't think about it. So, yeah. So having a veterinarian business of your own, do you specify what kind of pets you'll work on, or are you open to anything somebody brings in? Like, will you say, I'm not doing any fish, or I'm not doing any monkeys? Or is it just kind of any animal? Is yeah. So you can you can pick whatever you want to do. So there is even a, a hospital here in town that only does cats. So you can do only dogs and cats. You can do exotic animals too. So since I did mixed animal practice and I really, really loved it, I also still see farm pet animals. So if somebody considers like their goat a pet or their pig a pet, then I tell them, yeah, I'll see them just because I, I do enjoy working on those. And so we see about everything, and now I limit it to I'm not going to do somebody's, you know, cattle, um, horses. Now I, I have castrated a, a pony in our back of our hospital before. but Ooh. So we've done about everything, but I try to limit it to what I do and don't have as far as equipment for them because you need different equipment. So You ever done a tiger? Um, I have worked on a bear. Really? Yep. So up in Manhattan at the zoo, when I worked on some of the zoo animals in vet school, we we did a bear. I hadn't done a tiger yet, but did more monkeys there too. So So being a vet, can you get, I mean, I'm sure zoos have vets on hand, right? They do. For all their animals. Yep. So that's an opportunity too. If you went to vet school, you could work at a zoo. You definitely can. It's a lot different. That'd because, be awesome. Oh yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. Other than there's nothing out there telling you the best ways to work on it. I mean, you have a little bit, but there's not very much research. So. Not near as much guidance as no. uh, working on a human or something. Nope. You're extrapolating everything and hoping it, whatever you're using, isn't going to kill that species because there's not much on it. So. so when it comes to doing your practice, when you're neutering something or doing any other type of surgery, are you kind of just doing it your own way or are you going off of a, a way that's been done and a template? I make it up. 
Make it up. No, I'm just kidding. I know. <laughs> you just grab them with your hands. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we were all taught exactly how to do it in school. We've we've got tons of books that we go back to, and I constantly look at the newest stuff out there. So there might be better ways to do it now, and so I'm constantly looking at that. So you I don't chopped mind. a lot of balls off. <laughs> That's actually my favorite surgery. Are you serious? <laughs> yes. That's demented. Yeah, well, it's it's I don't know. It's not oh. for that reason. It's just it's kind of like popping a pimple. <laughs> ah, I'm not a fan of that either. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. That, <laughs> I've got you quiet now, don't it's, I? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's one of those things where it makes you just grab your knees and go, ah. Yeah, yeah. Why is that your favorite surgery? It, it, it is. It's kind of, it's one of those things, I shouldn't describe it, but it's, it, you just pop them out. And so it's one of pop those. Pop them out. <laughs> When you remove them, yeah. So you just you have to cut it first, though, right? Well, yeah, you cut the outside of, out, you know, the skin layer, and then you pop them out. And so it's one of those <sighs> things where it's just, um, I don't know, kind of like I said, like popping a pimple. Some people, I don't like how you describe some that. People you just get pop the, them out. Some people get the joy out of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> those people sound like serial killers. Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> so you just pop them out, and then you have to cut them off. You pop them out and cut them off. So yeah. what do you do with them? You know, if there's people that like mountain oysters, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We just throw them away. <laughs> don't please don't come dig out of my trash. <laughs> so you guys just throw all the extra parts in your trash can? Yeah, uh, there's biohazards. There's biohazards yep. you have to follow. Yep. Yeah, could just throw them out to the raccoons. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I never expected that to be someone's favorite surgery. Yeah, well, you know, it's like I said, it's fast, it's easy. There's a lot of surgeries I do that are really stressful honestly like a spay on a female dog is my least favorite surgery which is crazy because you do it all the time but it's actually what's a spay where you're so it's female so instead of like neutering a dog uh -huh. a male dog you're neutering the female so she can't get pregnant so you're taking out her ovaries and her uterus okay and so it's actually a huge surgery but people don't think of it that way because they're like oh, i'm just gonna get my you know my dog fixed it's like a hysterectomy then right? correct yeah. yeah it's called an ovary hysterectomy ovary you hysterectomy the ovaries too so so that's not a fun surgery? Not at all. I hate really? it. Really? <laughs> yep. Man. I'll do 20 neuters before I do this. <laughs> neuters are easy and fast, I guess. They Just are. pop them out. Yeah, that's all you got to do. So the dogs are put out then, obviously, or whatever animal it is. Yes, yep. Do you have an anesthesiologist that does that for you, or do you guys learn that? So our technicians at our hospital are awesome. You know, at most, you know, some vet clinics, it's the doctor doing it too, which is really hard to do your anesthesia while you're trying to do the surgery. Right. So we're really lucky that we have some awesome staff members and they've been trained on anesthesia. They do all of that. They monitor all the pets, everything. So that way I can just focus on surgery. So, That's good. Yeah. yeah. Having it all taken care of. Oh yeah. Yep. So it's just like doing a human then, I guess, when you put them out, right? It and is. And they wake up and they're... Yep. There they are. <laughs> wow. So. Do you ever declaw cats? That is something that does happen every now and then. It does. Uh, I know there's a big controversy about that. People, you have people on one side that say that it's terrible. It's like cutting their fingers off. And there's another, other people that say it's necessary for a house cat. What's your opinion on that? And yeah. so similar to like tail docking or taking dew claws off, none of it is, I would say, 100% necessary. So now are there pets that in order for them not to be, you know, put down that we declaw? Yeah. So if there's a cat that's inside that there's no other option for it, it's tearing up the house and it's going to be okay, we either put it down or we declaw it. That's when I say, okay, Let's do that so way we, that way it can at least live. So there are situations, and there's there's better ways to do declaws when we do have to do those to where it's not as painful, things like that. Is it probably not the right thing to do, though, if you're just doing it because you don't like their claws or you don't like them clawing things up? Yeah, so there's a lot of other things that you can do. I mean, you can get these cute little fancy things to cover their claws up. You can trim their nails. Little can, mittens? Uh, they're like little caps for their nails. Really? So, yeah all sorts of different colors <laughs> i mean kiss the cats need to scratch things yes for their claws right yes. that's yeah. a necessary thing in their life yes they they want to do it so and yeah, it sharpens their nails so does is it really like cutting their fingers off so you're taking the last digit out now i will say on the ones that i've seen or done i, I don't see any issues afterwards now there can be for sure but you do just have to be careful about which ones you decide to do it on and is there other ways to do things versus doing a declaw okay but i'm, I'm sure it's going to move the direction where it's not going to be allowed just yeah. with how everything else is going and, and eventually probably ear cropping and taking dock and tails and things like that probably too what's the ear cropping for there's not a huge reason it's mostly breed standard so some breeds are just 
um, where they have their ears cut to where they stand up straight like Dobermans. Is that for mainly dogs then? Yes. Yep. So they they clip the ears so that they're pointier? Yep. So it's just how they used to look, and they've looked for hundreds of years, even though there's not that I'm aware of any true purpose to it. Do you so. do that if somebody asks you to? I cannot draw a straight line, so I do not. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want your dog. You don't ears. want a curvy yeah. ear. <laughs> so yeah, I don't do those, and it, I mean I'm kind of glad I I'm not super straight on doing that because otherwise, you know, there would be some circumstances where people want it done. So. Right. So we just send them to another clinic for those types of things. So. I have docked tails and things like that. We use, you know, things to numb that to make sure they're not painful. But I'm assuming here in the near future we're going to see that all go away. Now, the cat's whiskers are very sensitive, yes. right? Yeah. They, they uh, coordinate their balance and all of that stuff. Um, have you seen some crazy stuff with that, people cutting the whiskers off or whatever? Nope. <laughs> no? <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. No, <laughs> nothing crazy with that. So, yeah. Yeah. I know it's really bad for them. I've seen videos where they're, like, walk, wobbling all over the place like they're drunk. Oh really? Yeah. Wow, that sounds I guess like it, it something. Does. Have you have you tried this? Uh, no, no. <laughs> okay. I didn't experiment on the animals. Okay. <laughs> no, I actually haven't ever seen that. So. Okay. Yep. Well, it's yeah. worth asking. Yeah. So. You mentioned earlier uh, euthanizing animals. Yep. That's probably one of the hardest parts of your job, I imagine. You know, not really. A lot of people think that, but most animals, when they're coming in, I look at it as ending their suffering sooner versus them just suffering. We do have some things we can kind of help as, you know, hospice-like to to give them to help them. But a lot of times, I'm actually relieving a lot of pain. Now, for the owners, it's really hard. That's a hard decision to make because you oh, for sure. never, hardly ever have to make that decision anywhere else in your life. And so for me, it's not now the hardest times is when it's a healthy dog or a dog that has something that could be fixed, but there's no money to do it. So that's what makes it hard for me is I feel like, gosh, I wish there was some way I can help. And, and every now and then we can find ways, but luckily at our clinic, we don't run into that very often, but I know it happens a lot at other places. That's super unfortunate. Yes. Yep. So you have had to do that though, where you've had a healthy dog that needs euthanized? I have. That yeah. sucks. It does. It does. And the way I look at it is I'm also on the board of the Kansas Humane Society. So I see a lot of pets, you know, that have a lot of potential to get adopted, but they may get put down because, you know, there's not room or there's not people to adopt. So the way I look at it is there's thousands and thousands of animals getting put down every single day. And so by me putting down one that's unfortunately has a serious condition or something that's happened to it that an owner can't afford, I have to look at it as, you know what, that gives another animal a chance. Right. So that's how I look at it because not everybody can afford it. I can't make somebody feel bad because they can't afford to do a major surgery, things like that. So I guess that's a big part of owning a pet. You shouldn't get a pet if you know you're not going to be able to afford it. Definitely. Or if you don't think you'll be able to afford it. Yep. And a lot of people don't know what that means. So. I see people come in and something unexpected happens where the, a dog needs like a three to four thousand dollar surgery. Well, most people don't plan for that. So yeah, I tell people either get insurance or just have a savings account that you just put money in every now and then for your pet. That way, if you need it, it's there. You don't have to make a hard decision later if something mm -hmm. were to happen. And if nothing happens, go take a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's something that people don't think about a lot, and that's unfortunate that people oh, I'm going to get this cute puppy for my kid or whatever, but they don't think about potential disaster like that where they have to pay a lot of money or they have to make a decision to put it down. Yes, yeah. I've had some animals that have eaten a sock three times in a row, and we've had to do <laughs> expensive surgeries three times in a row. So uh, fortunately for those pets, those owners were able to do it, but in most people's circumstances, I'd say that animal would have been put down. So, so socks don't come out? Not always. I've had a Great Dane that ate one sock that would not come out. So, oh. Yes. What's the weirdest thing you've seen an animal eat? Is this a child friendly, <laughs> child friendly show? This is a uh, whatever you want it to be. <laughs> well, we we have, now I'm very intrigued. All right, we've removed a lot of uh, underwear, and there was one time where we removed some underwear with some other gadgets that were in the stomach that we were all pretty convinced, you know, that might have been, you know, for the the, the clients. Um, so that was weird. We were kind of Googling, trying to figure it out. And I was like, we better stop. <laughs> was the owner embarrassed? 
you know, we took them to the owner. And we're like, hey, do you have any idea what these are? And I was just trying to get a reaction. And, of course, they're like, no, yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> you must have picked that up at someone else's house. <laughs> Weird. Well, there's a thong with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, it has your name on it. Yeah, yeah. So must have got it from someone else. That was definitely the craziest thing. So I was like, this is really awkward. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure you get some of those stories kind of like an ER doctor it gets to experience where people are doing things that they're embarrassed to admit. Yes, and yep. Yeah, it's swallowing fun. sex toys. Yeah, but it definitely keeps it interesting. I'll tell you that. That's for sure. It'd be boring if we didn't have yeah. this. <laughs> so. Oh yeah. So socks don't always pass. Yeah. I've had a dog that ate a sock too one time. Oh, yeah, there's a lot. That's of pretty dogs common. Why do they eat socks? I think they like the smell or something. Really? It must be that uh, Frito smell on people's feet. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's crazy. Well. Um, speaking of dogs and dog food, is there any dog food that you'd recommend? Yeah, so there's there's only actually a few out there that have a ton of research behind them. Um, there's probably thousands to pick from, so it makes it really hard for somebody to pick food. You might walk into a pet store and you've got this high schooler saying, hey, this is the best food. Well, they know absolutely nothing about nutrition. And so you can also Google stuff and find whatever you want. So the four companies that, that actually make a good food and that have you know research behind it are the ones that I usually recommend so I really like Purina Pro Plan is a good one so Purina can make some not so great ones and make some really good ones and the Pro Plan version is a great food so some of them aren't good from Purina and some are yeah so it's kind of like if you think of just our regular food you know there's different brands that make some junk snack foods and there's some that make some decent food as far as you know crackers things like that so yeah they just they make all sorts of difference because there's different price points okay and not just because it's expensive means it's a good food you can buy the most expensive food and it might be junk so it's hard to know it's not regulated well at all and so anybody can pretty much make a dog food as as long as they meet certain standards but it doesn't mean it's gonna be good for the dog so it's really hard to pick out a food but there's there's usually a few that veterinarians will let you know and those are usually the, the top ones to pick from is it better for a dog to eat the solid foods or like wet canned dog foods either one is fine a lot of people think that the wet foods maybe you know will make them have worse teeth things like that but there's been a ton of research behind that saying that it's all the same oh so, really yeah it just depends on if you want to spend more money on the wet food so. yeah wet food is a lot more expensive yep, yep. so really just if you're picking out a dog food do some research and find one that's backed up by science or vets. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tufts University has a really good questionnaire that says, hey, ask your dog food company all these questions. If they can answer them, then it's probably a good food. So, okay. Yeah. You know, one thing that people bring up all the time now that is kind of a thing that we don't see anymore is the white dog poop. Oh. And I think, what I, from what I've read, that's because of like the bone meal they used to put inside of the food. Do you know anything about that? You know, I, I'm pretty young, so that was way before my time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I honestly don't know a ton about that. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure there's been a huge change in foods because there was things that we were, you know, they were putting in foods a long time ago. They realized, hey, this isn't even getting absorbed the way it's supposed to. I went to a Science Dieter Hills Research Center not too long ago. They're actually in Topeka, and I was amazed at the research they put into the dog food. They, really? They literally analyze the food going in, analyze it coming out, and they even measure how gassy the animal is on it, like stuff that I'm like, this is crazy. I don't even think they do this with people food. <laughs> so things like that, they're, they're putting way more research into foods for sure. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, what's one of the funniest pet names you ever heard? Well, let's let's go back to some, um, let's see, recreational drugs. I've got an owner that she has named every single one of her pets a, a name from a recreational drug. So, like, Snickle Fritz. You're kidding me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, she, yeah, and, you know, most of us, you know, I didn't know all of them, and I get in there, and one of my staff's like, do you know what that means? And I'm like... No. So then I start Googling all the names and I was like, okay. <laughs> that's super classy. So yeah, that's pretty interesting. Named them after all drugs, yeah, huh? Yeah, but you know, hey, people each their own because my cats are all named after cheeses. So Are they? <laughs> uh, different types of cheese? Different types of cheese. So. That's, that's a good one. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, you got to have a theme going. <laughs> I'm a big cheese fan. Okay, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, but yeah, so those names are always funny and then a lot of like, I would say comic heroes things like that we see a lot of that or whatever movies popular at the time we see a ton of that so yeah um if you had to give some advice to people not on names but on just owning a pet in general what would your number one thing be that's hard because there's probably two 
I'm going to give two. you two. Yeah, yeah. And so one would be the money part is save save something aside just so that way you have money in case of an emergency because pets do add up. The second thing I would say is look into the pet you're getting just because huskies are beautiful dogs, but they're not good for everybody. They're very high energy. They like to run away. So it's really important to look into what you're getting and make sure that you have the lifestyle for that pet too. Okay. So. Yeah. That's some good advice there. Yeah. Have you ever seen uh, half huskies, half wolves or half wolf, half dog? Getting ready other to have one coming next week. Are you really? And I just uh, put down one a couple of years or a couple of weeks ago, I'd say. Yeah. Is there anything special about owning those? Would you recommend against doing that? You know, I don't see them very often. But I would say you do have to be careful because if they are closer to non-domesticated animals, you are just more at risk of something happening that, yeah. you know, isn't predictable. It's more like a wild animal. It is. It is. Uh, we see Bengal cats, which are similar. I don't know if you know what those are. They're like the cats that have like the spots on them. They look kind of like... Oh, they look like a cats. leopard or yes, something? Yep. Yeah. So similar, they, they have some more issues here and there just because, you know, we're trying to do everything for a domesticated cat that... You know, you don't necessarily do for cats in the wild. They need more activity, things like that. So we see those here and there where people have things that are part something wild and they just have to be prepared to have them. Yeah. Do their research. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess one thing that I want to know is in the vet life, what would you say the hardest part about being a vet is? I would say the the hardest part of being a veterinarian is probably those pets, like I said, that, you know, when people don't have the finances and we have to put their animals down and, and what you want to do is help them. But when, especially being a business owner, you can't do that for everybody because right. then you're just going to tank your business. You have to pay your staff. So I have to really separate my emotions out just because I have a big heart and I would love to just discount everybody's stuff. I would love to find some money, help them out. But you have to separate it, and you can't take things, you know, personally. On I couldn't save that one because, you know, I could have, but I, you know, they but didn't it, have the money. It doesn't make sense financially. Yeah, because yeah. you you beat yourself up all the time. I would say as a veterinarian, because you constantly go home and say, could I have done something different? Could I have done something to help that pet? Or you just feel guilty. Some of those people, you know, they may not think about it, but they blame you and they say, aren't you in this for the love of animals? Why aren't you just helping my pet? So a lot of that you know, starts to affect you. Um, I don't know if you know this, but veterinarians are like one of the number one occupations to, to do suicide. Is that right? It is. And it's just because most of us have pretty big hearts and then we take a lot of crap sometimes from yeah. people that may come in and we work long hours, things like that. And we take it all very personal. So a lot of times we kind of have to get past that review that was negative or what somebody said, but it's hard when you're just constantly pouring your heart and soul into everything. It's got to be hard because most, yeah. most vets are probably just like you where they went into it for the sole love of their, of animals. Yep. And to have to deal with that and shitty owners that are blaming you, I mean, that's a shitty thing to do. It, it, it is. And, and, and like I said, I'm sure it happens in most industries, but it, it does hurt when it's somebody's, it's almost like somebody's kid. And when somebody puts it on you that you can't help their child pretty much, it, it kind of affects you a lot. And so I always just have to tell my staff, you know, take your vacations, let's get through this. Or you're doing CPR on a dog and a dog, you know, things like that. They're working hard and they work their butts off. And whether they're a vet or whether they're an assistant or a technician, they work so hard and we don't get recognized a lot. Mm -mm. So we always just try to let them know, hey, you're doing a great job because all you think about and hear about, same with everybody else, is the negatives. And so that's important to remember that there's always the positives out there that we just don't hear. Yeah, that is kind of a, a bad thing that vets don't really get the recognition that the rest of like, the, you look at the first responder groups, you have like firefighters, police officers, EMTs, doctors, you guys are always kind of missed there. Nobody really throws you in that group, even though you're you're the ones that are fixing everybody's. I mean, pets are part of your family. Yeah. Most people today have pets, and they all consider them part of their family. You're the one that's doing that. You're a doctor for their pet, part of the family. So that's yeah. You guys need more recognition for sure. <laughs> people don't understand how hard that is. Yeah, we joke around a lot because you know a lot of people will be like, "Well, real doctors." <laughs> like, <laughs> like we are the real doctors. <laughs> we are the real doctors. Yeah. People have their weird uh, preconceptions about yeah. who's what and who gets recognition for what. Yeah. But Well, on the flip side of that, what would you say the best part of your job is? It, it is 
being able to help foster the bond for people, honestly, and, and take care of those animals that mean so much to people. So to me, it's amazing to see what animals do for people. So when you walk in your door and you just had a rough day and your pet comes up and greets you, like that's the best thing in the world. Oh yeah. Like my husband sits there and he's like, can I wag my tail and get all excited and you'll treat me like that? And I'm like, well, man, my, my dogs, they just love me. So they give us unconditional love. And I think it's really cool to take care of somebody's pet for them to give them that unconditional love, you know, even if it's, it's gotta be very rewarding for sure. It is, it is. And it's, you know, people say, Hey, do you just love animals? And I love animals, but I really love what animals do for people. And that's why I do it. Yes. Do you think that it feels like eternity for dogs whenever they're waiting for you? (laughs) <laughs> the whole day? Probably just staring at the door. Probably just staring day. at the door. Like, oh. It makes you wonder what they think about and do all day. That's it makes sure. you wonder what time is like for them because their lives are so much shorter. Yes. Could be like a month Yeah. when you're gone for the day. It's true. That's true. Who that's, knows? That's why they're so excited. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Well, um, I guess any last advice you would give to somebody that's wanting to be a vet or somebody that's interested in being a vet? What would you give advice? What kind of advice would you give somebody like that? Yeah, I always tell people to shadow or go f- go see what it's like because it's not always what you think it is. And if you put the time and money into doing it, you've got to love it. Otherwise, you end up wasting all that money. And and we don't get paid a ton of money, so you're doing it really just because you love what you do. And so you've really got to enjoy it. So just make sure that you're checking it out first and and it's really what you want to do for the rest of your life know what you're getting into for sure yeah and also know that there's a lot of opportunities i didn't realize that until you told me today that there's all sorts of different fields you could go into basically with a vet degree definitely definitely. so awesome well uh what's your business's name prairie ridge animal hospital prairie ridge animal hospital bring your pets unless they're monkeys (laughs) yeah definitely all righty well cheers melanie thanks for coming on And uh, best of luck with your business. Thank you.